couple days ago, someone threw the phrase two brides, one stone at me as a way to describe something that we had been discussing in Scripture. And uh, certainly I have shared pieces of this before, but what I'd like to do is put together a large picture here for you that will help bring into view uh, exactly what, um, what Scripture has to say or what I believe Scripture has to say. What if I told you that um, there's a battle between Christianity and Judaism and it is foretold and pictured in Scripture? Now, I think most of us recognize that because we see that Christianity and Judaism have kind of been going at each other for a long time and it's a wrestling match. Uh, the question is, who is right? Is Christianity right? Is Judaism right? Is neither right? Maybe they're both right. Or maybe we haven't seen the complete picture and we don't understand how the pieces fit together. So what I want to do is I want to show you a, a couple things here. Um, what if I told you that some history is prophecy? Some history, some historical events that we see, we, we read about in Scripture are prophetic. Okay? For example... Did you know that David had a first and second coming? Now, we recognize that David is a picture of the Messiah. And uh, typically, we assume or we, we think that his first coming was in the David and Goliath chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 17, I think it is. But do you know that's his second coming? And in his second coming, he shows up to, comes to the battle where Israel is in deep distress. They're surrounded by the nations of Philistines, and there is a champion and a false prophet in front of him, and the champion is wearing scale armor, and he's speaking monstrous things against the Most High. And it says that David came down from Jerusalem, right, or came down to the battle, and uh, his brothers give him a hard time. The, the, the brothers that are there, David's bringing 10 cheeses and 10, uh, 10 breads with him, I think is the way it is. It's been a while since I've reviewed this. But the bottom line is, is he's a picture of the Messiah. And ultimately, he defeats the adversary that is uh, seeking to enslave all of Israel. He does it not with a sword in his hand. And Yeshua, when he does that, will not have a sword in his hand. It'll be the sword of his mouth. And David got a bride, Michael. He got, uh, his family was free in the land, and his name was made great. We see that. But what was his first coming? If you look at the chapter right before, when Saul, you recall, uh, had an evil spirit that was plaguing him, they searched for someone who could come and, and play music to soothe him, and David is the one that's selected. And it says that David came riding on a donkey with bread and wine and a young goat, a sacrifice. Bread, wine, and a young goat. That was his first coming. David, in that, those two passages of Scripture, 1 Samuel 16 and 17, it's a picture of Yeshua's first and second coming. Well, there's another one. Um, uh, you're familiar with Joseph, and I, I don't have this in my slide here, but uh, Joseph as a picture of the Messiah um, who was buried, proclaimed to be dead, sent out of the land, didn't look like, doesn't look like Joseph, the brother uh, who speaks Hebrew. He's no longer dressed like a Hebrew or acting like a Hebrew in the eyes of uh, Judah and his brothers. And ultimately... When they come, it's Joseph who saves the family and restores the family and protects them and provides for them and everything else. Most of us are very familiar with the uh, Joseph as Yeshua picture. We also see Joseph as a partial picture of uh, his own people who are sent out of the land, scattered, lose their lose their identity are not recognized by their brother but that's a slightly different story that's actually related to what we're going to talk about here um most of us are familiar with jacob as a picture of the messiah and the history of their pieces of jacob's life historically that are identical to or very closely fit with the larger scope of scripture and so we're going to take a look at that what if I told you, 
I have to figure out how to do this so that I'm not, uh, not constantly uh, highlighting that on my screen. What if I told you that some of the inherited traditions that we have can lead to false understandings or conclusions? Now, um, something we should do is test everything. That's a phrase that many of you are familiar with, uh, is test everything. And, uh, and when we find a sacred cow, or a golden calf as the case may be, we need to break that down. We need to tear it down. We're commanded to tear down the false traditions and the false idols, right? What if I told you a shocking truth? And I'm going to prove this from Scripture, okay? Because this is deeply related. It's intimately related to all of prophecy, to all of history. What if I told you God has two, two brides? A proper paradigm for viewing all of Scripture is through the lens of understanding that God has two brides. It's a correct understanding of prophecy. We're going to, uh, we're going to take a look at um, all of this. And I will address the one bride fallacy as answered uh, with, with, uh, with a brief answer in the uh, frequently asked questions at the tail end of this. So hold that in one hand. If, if you've already got you know, red flags going on, I challenge you to sit down, buckle your seatbelt, and let's see what Scripture has to say, and let's see how that may alter our understanding of history and alter our understanding of what's going on between Christianity and Judaism and why there's, the, there's been this um, contention, this envy and jealousy between the two. Okay, so if we look at Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 6 through 12, <clears throat> it tells us, Then Yahweh said to me in the days of Yoshea the king, Have you seen what faithless Israel did? She went up on every high hill and under every green tree, and she was a harlot there. I thought, after she has done all these things, she will return to me. But she did not return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. And I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a writ of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah, Yehuda, did not fear, but she went and was a harlot also. Because of the lightness of her harlotry, she polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. Yet in spite of all this, her treacherous sister Yehuda did not return to me with all her heart, but rather in deception, declares Yahweh. And Yahweh said to me, Faithless Israel has proved herself more righteous than treacherous Yehuda. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, faithless Israel, declares Yahweh. I will not look any or I will not look upon you in anger, for I am gracious, declares Yahweh. I will not be angry forever. Challenging passage of scripture right there. We see that God divorced, sent away, and gave a writ of divorce to Israel, or the house of. We'll, uh, I'll demonstrate this is the house of Israel in a minute. God did not divorce the house of Judah or Yehuda. God in that passage calls Yehuda and Israel sisters. And something that most of us are aware of is that you cannot divorce half of a woman. Now, I know sometimes I make a little bit of a joke out of this, but the simple fact is I, I don't care how much a man wants to divorce, you know, just the bad qualities or the qualities that he doesn't like in his woman. He can't divorce half of her. It's all or nothing which again is demonstrated and supported here with Israel and Yehuda. Okay? And we'll see this more in the next passage of Scripture. Take a look at this one. Ezekiel chapter 23, verses 1 through 5. The word of Yahweh came to me again, saying, Son of man, there were two, two women, the daughters of one mother. And they played the harlot in Mitzrayim, in Egypt. They played the harlot in their youth. There their breasts were pressed, and there their virgin bosom was handled. Their names were Ahola the elder and Aholabah her sister. And they became mine, and they bore sons and daughters. And as for their names, Samaria is Ahola, and Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, Shomron, and 
or Shechem, I guess it would be, and uh, Yerushalayim as Oholaba, right? Two, do- two women, daughters of one mother, who bore sons and daughters, and they were daughters of one mother in Egypt before they came out of Egypt. How about Jeremiah chapter 31? Now, this is a passage of Scripture we are all very familiar with. Behold, days are coming, it says Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Yehuda. Not like the covenant I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Mitzrayim. My covenant which they broke, though I was an husband to them declares Yahweh. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my Torah, law, within them, and on their heart I will write it, and I will be their Elohim, and they shall be my people. Jeremiah chapter 33. This is our fourth witness, right? And the word of Yahweh came to Yirmiyah, saying, Have you not observed what these people have spoken, saying, The two families which Yahweh chose, two families which Yahweh chose, he has, reject, have, he has rejected them? Thus they despise my people. No longer are they as a nation in their sight. Thus says Yahweh, If my covenant for day and night not stand, and the fixed patterns of heaven and earth I have not established, then I would reject the descendants of Yaakov and Dawid my servant, not taking them, not taking from his descendants rulers over the descendants of Avraham, Isaac, and Yaakov, but I will restore their fortunes and I will have mercy on them. Are you shocked? And if you are, why? For a lot of people, when they see these passages, it's like, never saw that before. Or maybe nobody told you, right? This isn't, this isn't something that we're going to hear a lot. Why? Because Christendom says, we're the bride. Judaism says, we're the bride. Scripture says, house of Israel and house of Judah. Not once, not twice, clearly three times. And there's the fourth where it talks about two families that belong to him. So clearly God portrays himself as having two brides. And in this, we need to shatter a paradigm. We've we've been operating and looking at scripture from the paradigm of we're the bride and they're not. But that's not what he says. Okay, why? Why do we need to take a look at this? I think reasons that we need to look at this, number one, is truth. And I I really need to do an extended video on reasons why we need to really wrestle with this and go into depth. But the real reason that we want to look at it today is because it's deeply connected. The second reason that I want to give right now is that it's deeply connected to prophecy and it's deeply connected to understanding how he operates and why, um, why we're in the place that we're in right now today in the world and what the significance of that is. So what about monogamy? Okay, well, monogamy is never taught in Scripture, or monogamy only. Marriage is the only thing that God talks about, okay? He says it's good for a man to find a wife, okay? He never, ever condemns, and he actually describes himself as having more than one bride. He never condemns that. And there are places where, uh, and I've got lots of resources and research to this, this end, there are lots of places in Scripture where he affirms where he claims to be giving bride, you know, I gave David his, uh, his master's wives, his women, and I would have given him more if he had asked. Second uh, Samuel chapter 12, verse 8, I think is where it is. So what is God's purpose? Because this is really kind of a strange sort of thing. It's different, right? Let's take a look at this. Let's go. Let, let's dig in. Uh, dig, uh, dig into this a little bit. Let's let's dip into this. Okay. Um, one of the things that we want to look at is we want that to look at Jacob as prophecy. Jacob's historical life, the history of Jacob. 
his life is prophecy. There's a lot of prophecy woven into it, or it's a prophetic picture, just like David is a prophetic picture, just like uh, Joseph is a prophetic picture. We see Jacob as a prophetic picture. Jacob had two wives, Leah and Rachel, plus the two maidservants, okay? So technically four, but over and over, Scripture portrays it as two, and each of those women uh, is responsible for the um, the sons that were born to uh, to their maidservants as well. Um, in Genesis chapter 29, verses 21 through chapter 30, verse 24, it, it clearly tells us multiple times that God opens and closes wombs. He opens Leah's room, womb. He does not open Rachel's womb. Later, when Rachel's upset, she's beaten on Jacob's chest, and she says, Give me sons, or else I die. And Jacob says, Am I in the place of God? He's basically saying, You need to talk to him, because that's his deal. That's not my deal. I can't open your womb. And then we see that only after... Uh, Rachel has given her maidservant to Jacob and received two sons. And Z uh, Leah has given her maidservant, Zilpah, to, uh, to Jacob. And uh, technically, I guess that would have been the fourth wife. Uh, and, and Leah receives two sons. Then it tells us in verse 22 that God opened Rachel's womb. So he closed it for the purpose of bringing about the 12 tribes of Israel. He, he closed her womb in order to create the circumstances that led to Jacob having four wives and um, having 12 sons. So Genesis chapter 32 through 33 is often referred to as the time of Jacob's trouble. This is where um, he's getting ready to go back into the land. He's about to cross the Yabak, heading uh, south on the east side of the Yardin uh, before he crosses the, the Yardin into, uh, into the land. And as he's coming down, um, he hears that Esau has heard that he's coming and, or he sends messengers, and then Esau's coming with 400 men. And Jacob is in trouble. He's deeply distressed. So how does Jacob save his family during this time? He divides them in two. And he sends Leah ahead with, uh, with, uh, their, um, with her sons, and then sends Rachel with Yosef. And it doesn't tell us where the maidservants are initially. I think later it tells us that they are farther in front. But the picture, specific names are given. Leah, then Rachel. And so by extrapolation, we understand too that it was Judah who went and then Joseph, right? So we'll hear more about this in a minute. But it demonstrates how God preserves the whole family through, throughout history because God did the same thing. He divided the house so that he could bring them through the difficult throes of history and accomplish his purposes in the process. And I'm going to prove this as we go. Okay. So let's look at these two brides and their many names. Okay. So we're familiar with Leah and we're familiar with Rachel. Leah, of course, is often referred to, uh, or her, her progeny, often referred to as Judah, because Judah was her fourthborn. And Judah ultimately was the one with the scepter, and the house of Judah ruled over Israel, all Israel at one point, through David and Solomon. Uh, it's often referred to as the house of Judah. I see it referred to as Jerusalem. Uh, we see it, at, which we just did in Ezekiel chapter 23. We see it referred to as Aholabah in Ezekiel 23 as well. Rachel is referred to as Joseph or the stick of Joseph in the hand of Ephraim. You're familiar with that from Ezekiel chapter 37. And in Jeremiah chapter 31, where we just read the new covenant, if you back up a little bit, uh, God in that chapter is actually calling out to Ephraim and saying he longs for Ephraim, my, my uh, dear son, to return. And specifically, just verses before that, around verse 15, it talks about Rachel weeping for her children. 
the connections right there, unmistakable. House of Israel is the term for the northern kingdom, which descended from um, Joseph through Ephraim. Jeroboam was an Ephraimite. He was from the tribe of Ephraim. He was the first king, and his dynasty is what sat on the throne for the rest of that time. Okay? And that's uh, we hear Samaria and Ahola, uh, as we see both of those references in Ezekiel chapter 23. Okay? In uh, my book, Ten Parts in the King, The Prophesied Reconciliation of God's Two Witnesses, page 44 has a chart before at the beginning of the chapter on twos. And at the time that I wrote that book, I was not understanding marriage or the marriage picture that I'm sharing with you today. But I did understand the twos, and I understood two houses, and I understood that Judah and Israel are the two that over and over and over, those are the, the two pieces, the two sticks, the two parts that God wants to bring back together into the house of Jacob, one house, right? Two sticks. But we see it as, uh, in Scripture as two witnesses. We see the witness of Moses and Elijah. Uh, those actually at the bottom of that same group there are as truth, the Torah, and spirit. We see that with Eliyahu. We see them as the two olive trees. We see that, and, and, and these, each of these are very carefully explained and demonstrated and proven directly from the Scriptures um, in uh, Ten Parts in the King. The prophesied, uh, the, the prophesied witnesses, or the prophesied reconciliation of God's two witnesses. Okay, um, two candlesticks. We see the olive trees and the candlesticks present both in Zechariah chapter four and in Revelation chapter eleven. Everybody wants to say, "Well, who are the two witnesses?" And they're trying to figure it out. Is it Moses and Elijah? Maybe it's Ephraim and Yehuda. And that's something to look at. Okay, heaven and earth. God uses that multiple times through Scripture as his two witnesses. Law and prophets, the two witnesses, okay, spirit and truth. We also see that at Shavuot, uh, at, at Pentecost, two leavened loaves, not unleavened, leavened loaves. Two leavened loaves are waved to the four corners of the earth, right? Who do those two loaves represent? right? Who do they represent? All right. House of Israel, house of Judah, I contend. Two silver trumpets. Why two silver trumpets? We see the two sisters. We just talked about them, Ahola and Aholabah in Ezekiel chapter 23. We see the two sons, the prodigal son and the elder brother, the one that went away and squandered his inheritance and then came home. The other who stayed in his father's house, but maybe wasn't always doing everything he was supposed to do or doing it with the right attitude and so on and so forth, but was always in the house, never left the house. How about um, two sticks? Ezekiel chapter 37, right? Ephraim and Judah, right? Or two families, as we just saw in Jeremiah chapter 34, Ephraim and Judah. Again, all of these are spelled out and explained. There's a detailed analysis of the two witnesses in um, my book, Ten Parts in the King. That book is available on Amazon. But it doesn't dig into the, what we're talking about here. And so what we're doing right now is we're taking the information in that book and taking it to the next level. We're carrying it forward, okay? So we, we recognize, I think it's pretty easy to, to understand that God's two witnesses are Ephraim and Judah. That's easy to accept. But really, two brides? Why is this a challenging thought? The fact is, is Christendom says, we're the bride of Messiah. Nobody else. You got to come to us to be part or come to the Messiah and be like us, one of us, right? And Judaism says, you got to take on the Torah. The whole Torah. Not be like those Christians. We've got the we've we've got the husband. We belong to God. So one bride is commonly accepted because we operate inside of a monogamy only mindset, but that monogamy only mindset does not come from Scripture. That monogamy only mindset comes from 
Greco-Romanism, and I, I prove this in other videos that I've done. If, I, I would recommend that you go and watch. I've got a whole series that deals with a bunch of this. But it proves that Greco-Roman paganism, Numa's law, Greco-Roman law, and then Tertullian uh, relying on uh, what he thought was a higher ideal pursued monogamy in his dem, uh, dem monogamia on monogamy around the 300s and he began laying foundations for that and it didn't it was not codified into uh, Protestant or uh, Catholic law until 1560 or 1563 at the Count, Council of Trent um, Scripture though clearly states two brides it says it i just showed you four places right it's challenging is there a prophetic reason why did god portray himself this way and does he have a purpose i say yes so let's dig in okay before we go dipping too deeply into that, let's ask who is the husband. And I've already already mentioned that the Jews believe that God the Father is the husband, right? And uh, they would point to all of the examples that present an image as God the husband. Christians believe Yeshua, Jesus, is the husband. And it's generally taught in church that the church is the bride, right? Christ, Christ is the husband and we are the bride, right? Nobody else unless you come to us. Who's right? All this fighting that we've had for 2,000 years right here, just like this. Has it been productive? Has it gotten us what we think we're supposed to be doing? Or is there another picture we have been missing? Something that's interesting in the life of Jacob is the presence of a stone. The stone. Often, particularly in chapters 32 and 33, uh, in 28-ish, stone comes up. Why? Well, let's look at this. The word av means father. Aleph, bait. That means father. Right? And, uh, you know, just to look at the Paleo Hebrew right quick, Aleph is typically an ox head and it means strength or head of leader and bait means house okay then ben the word bait noon ben means sun right bait means house noon has to do with um with sprouting or uh, a growth generation can also be fish as in multiply uh, we see that particularly um, present in the prophecy of uh, Jacob over Ephraim and Manasseh when he says may they be like fish in the middle of the earth okay multitude or a multitude of the, in the seas um, it gets translated as, may they grow as a multitude in the midst of the earth. But technically, it's talking about fish. Okay? But what if we put the whole thing together? Aleph, bait, noon. Eben means stone. This is an amazing picture of father and son together as the stone. Eben. Right? And what's uh, even more interesting here is looking at the paleo and recognizing that Aleph looks like an ox head and means strength or head. Bait means house or family. And fish means, uh, or noon means to fish or sprout. Planting. Ben also can mean the the product of or the carrying on of or the 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 planter of the house right because what he does the son does is he carries forward the house he's the protector of um and he's the he's the progeny that leads it forward right as in like the firstborn okay and these letter and word pictures are derived uh, i i got from hebrew word pictures by dr frank t 
Seekins, just for reference. Terrific book. Well, we use that word stone. Uh, it, we're all familiar with, I think, some of these different verses. A stone which the builders rejected has become the chief corner stone. It's often applied to Yeshua, right? Then it shall become a sanctuary, but to both the houses of Israel, Judah and Israel, a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Yerushalayim. Again, seems to be a prophecy specifically of Yeshua, who is the son, but then stone connected with the father. The two are inseparable. They're echad. We could say this, united. Therefore, I say, or thus says uh, Adonai Yahweh, Behold, I am laying a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed. He who believes will not be disturbed. Isaiah 28, verse 16. But what's Jacob's connection with the stone? I would encourage you to go back and read the story of Jacob and watch the places that stone shows up and the significance. But let's look at a couple of them here. Uh, he came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set, and he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. Genesis chapter 28, verse 11. And you recall that is the point at which he has the dream of the ladder to heaven, and at the top is standing the Almighty and their angels and um, ascending and descending on the ladder. Uh, and in the morning, Jacob rose early and took the stone and that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called the name of that place Beit El. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz. Okay. Previously, the name had been Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, If God will be with me and, I, and will keep me um, on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety, then Yahweh will be my Elohim. This stone, which I have set up as a pillar, will be Elohim's house and all of... Uh, and of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Stone. But there's more. So Jacob continues on his journey. And he shows up at Haran. And uh, he comes to a well. And, it's, and uh, I've, I've taken a bunch of pieces out here just to really compress this passage of Scripture. But I want you to notice. Behold, three flocks of sheep. Okay, Three flocks were lying there. The stone on the mouth of the well was large. So this is a big stone, and under the stone is the water that brings life to all of these flocks. There's a point, okay? Uh, so then they would roll the, uh, when all the flocks were gathered, when all the flocks were gathered, they would then roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place on the mouth of the well. Who is the stone? We've already looked at this, right? Av, Av, or Aleph, Beit, Nun, right? Father, son picture, united, the stone, okay? Rachel came with her father's sheep. Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the mouth of the well and watered the flock. Picture, 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 okay? So we've seen Jacob as prophecy, or we've seen pieces of that. Now let's look at Jacob as prophecy. So after Jacob takes, he takes two brides. He takes one and gets the other one kind of as a surprise. Um, and then through the circumstances that God orchestrates, read the passage carefully, God orchestrates by closing wombs and opening wombs, he sets the stage for Jacob to have four wives and 11 sons as he is leaving Haran. And he flees Laban's house and he's headed south. He's returning home. It's been 20 years at least since he left the land. And 
uh, finds out that Esau is coming. This is the time of Jacob's troubles. He's in deep water right now. It's him and his flocks and his sons, and he's probably got some some uh, servants, maid servants, men, uh, man servants, so on and so forth, helping with all of this. But it's it's a big operation. Nevertheless, four hundred man army coming with Esau. He's in deep water, and so he divides the family. Genesis chapter thirty two. And he says, maybe if one gets attacked, the other will escape. That's really what his reasoning is. If I can get one through uh, and the other, you know, I lose the other one, well, maybe there'll be some survivors to carry on, family name to carry on the future of, um, of him, Israel. His name is now Israel. And then he wrestles with the Most High, or he wrestles with... A certain man is what it says. Technically, I think he was wrestling with Yeshua. No man can see God and live, uh, and yet here he is wrestling with one who has the authority to rename him, has the authority to give him commands and give him instruction. Uh, I believe it's Yeshua that he wrestles with. But at the end of the day, he wakes up in the morning. He, he the thought, socket of his thigh, or he doesn't wake up. I guess he wrestled all night. Um, the socket of his thigh is touched. He's walking with a limp. He crosses over last and then goes before all of them towards Esau, and they have this big negotiation, chapter 33. At the end of the day, Esau says, come on down and might see her. We'll take care of you, right? Um, and uh, as soon as Esau is turned and headed out, Jacob goes and he heads towards Sukkot. He goes to Sukkot. He brings the whole families back together, and he goes into the land to Sukkot. And there's a prophetic picture right there, too. Pay close, close, close attention, okay? Because there's some more pieces that happen, but this is the big picture. What I want you to see is I want you to see the families together. He divides them, shepherds them through this difficult time, and then he brings them back together, and then they continue. That's what I want you to see. I want you to understand this picture because this is the same thing the Father has done with the house of Jacob through history. And I'm going to show it to you. So Jacob decides, it divides his house. We just sort of talked through this uh, or, or what he did then. But at the end of his life, when he's blessing the sons, he divides his house. He does it again. And he specifically says in the latter section, at the beginning of chapter 49, he said, this has to do with the last days. You'll you'll understand this at the end of days. But during the blessing over Judah, he says, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him the obedience of the peoples. Right? He gives the scepter, rulership, headship, to Judah. But Israel stretched out out his right hand, this is in the previous chapter, his right hand and lays it on the head of Ephraim, who was the younger brother, and his left hand on Manasseh, crossing, crossing his hands. Although Manasseh was the firstborn, then he blesses Joseph. He's got his hands on the boy's head. He's blessing Joseph. This is how Joseph gets a double portion. And he says specifically that my name may live on in them. This is how Ephraim and the house of Israel got the name of Israel. And the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and may they grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. This is where actually he says a multitude of fish, I believe is what the Hebrew says. I'd have to go back and double check it, but I think that's what it says. So Judah, uh, 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 Jacob divides the house. Judah, or Leah, receives the scepter. Joseph, from Rachel, receives the double portion and the name. How did he get the double portion? The double portion, in part, is because Joseph is removed and Jacob adopts his two sons in Joseph's place, Ephraim and Manasseh, Manasseh, and the two are then given equal inheritance with their uncles and are full tribes in Israel, resulting in technically 13 tribes. Now we know that there were 12 tribes all the way around, but then Levi, Levi was around the tabernacle, and so that was the 13th, that, that, that's... Uh, helps us understand it's 13 tribes. It's always described as 12, but technically 13 tribes. 
But Joseph received the double portion in this manner, the tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Manasseh. So Jacob chose to divide his house to convey it through danger. He did that at the time that he was facing off with Esau, and prophetically does that at the time of his death before, or I guess they have just gotten into Egypt at this point. Okay, His family's been in Egypt for about 17 years. God divided his house, the house of Jacob, for similar reasons, to convey it through history and keep the parts safe and separate. And he has a purpose with all of this. We'll talk about that purpose a little bit here in a minute. We recognize, too, that in Scripture, specifically, Ezekiel chapter 23 tells us that God viewed them as two women, two families, two sisters, while they were still in Egypt. This is before Mount Sinai. God already pictures, views them, sees them as two. Two. And they were covenanted together at the same time, not to each other, but to him, at the same time at Mount Sinai. See, a lot of people think, oh no, Israel wasn't divided until they got to, um, Israel wasn't divided until they got to uh, Mount Sinai, but that's just not true. The fact is God already viewed them as two separate houses. He already viewed them as two separate houses. He divided them in 1 Kings chapter 12 with a purpose. Or we see that's where God really ultimately says it's time for this one to go that direction and this one to go that direction. And he's got a purpose. So 1 Kings chapter 12, let's take a look at this for just a, just a second. We're going to use some select verses here. When all Israel saw that the king, this is Rehoboam, did not listen to them, the people answered the king saying, what portion do we have in David? Notice they don't say, what portion do we have in Judah? They say, what portion do we have in David? The rebellion of the northern kingdom was against the house of David, and that's significant if the house of David is where Yeshua comes from. Okay? That's, that, that's important. Think about that. We have no inheritance in the son of Yes Yeshai. I guess it's Yeshai. Yesi. Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now look after your own house, David. So Israel departed to their tents, but as for the sons of Israel who lived in the cities of Yehuda, Rehoboam reigned over them. So some elements of the northern kingdom continued to reside with the southern kingdom, and we see later on that elements of the northern kingdom went to the south. So when you read Ezekiel chapter 37, you'll notice that it talks about the two sticks, the sick of Judah and the stick of Joseph in the hand of Ephraim, and it specifically tells us that there are elements of all 12 tribes in both sticks, right? Specifically tells us that. The way that it's worded, and his brothers with him, uh, all Israel. Go back and look at that. But it says, So Israel departed to their tents, but as for the sons of Israel who lived in the cities of Yehuda, Rehoboam reigned over them. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. That's very important. It came about when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, that they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. None but the tribe of Yehuda followed the house of David. So this is the point at which, and, and technically I think uh, Benjamin and most of Levi and, and uh, Shimon, Simeon, had already been absorbed into Judah. But the bottom line is, this is the point at which Ephraim, Jeroboam, a son of uh, Ephraim, uh, became the head of and the, the kingly uh, tribe and the, the dynasty that resided in uh, Shechem. Now, when Rehoboam uh, had come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Yehuda and the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against the house of Israel to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Shlomo. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Shlomo, king of Yehuda, and to all the house of Israel and Benjamin, 
and to the rest of the people, saying, Thus says Yahweh, You must not go up and fight against your relatives, the sons of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing has come from me. So they listened to the word of Yahweh and returned and went their way according to the word of Yahweh. This thing has come from me. God chose at this point for the two houses to travel different paths, different directions. And I think he had a, had a specific plan and purpose for each half. We'll, we'll uh, touch on that here in just a second. Okay. I think the uh, I, I think parts of those purposes we can see here will we will see a little bit more in the upcoming images, but the Messiah needed to be born from Yehuda. Okay, so the house of Yehuda had to stay in covenant, and it stayed um, stayed true. The the Leviim, the priests, stayed with, and the of course the tabernacle temple at this point were with the house of Judah. The Torah needed to be guarded and transmitted through history. Who has done this? It's been done wonderfully, not perfectly. It's been done under great persecution, largely at the hands of Ephraim, largely at the hands of Christianity. Has the Torah been transmitted through history? Even Paul tells us that to them has, have been given the oracles. All right? I, you know, and, and we can have a discussion. Certainly they have not, uh, have not been uh, perfect in their teaching, but they've been better at keeping it and better at transmitting it than anybody else ever. Okay? It was their job. God had this as part of their destiny. Another purpose is that the seed of Abraham needed to be scattered over and then reaped from the whole earth. Have you ever noticed that Matthew chapter 15 verse 24 says, I came only, Yeshua says, I came only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel? He didn't say I came for the lost sheep of the house of Judah. Now, I believe that both houses need the Messiah. There's no question. But by having the northern kingdom commit the idolatry that they did or spiritual adultery and then be scattered to the ends of the earth, it took the seed of Abraham to the ends of the earth. But then it was those very Gentiles down the road later on. They became pagans. They forgot who they were. That's what the prophets tell us would happen. Then, ultimately, it was them, by their own imperfect abilities, carry the name of Yeshua to the ends of the earth, saying, Hey, wait, the king is here, and we have redemption. We can return to the covenant, though we don't necessarily understand what that covenant is. Or, we, or do we? We'll cover that in a second. Here it is, the stone, Yeshua. But he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He also said, I have other sheep which are not of this fold. He's speaking to Judah, and he's talking about the house of Israel. I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. Okay? John 10, 16, right? One flock with one shepherd. And, uh, and the one flock here, we're going to talk about the house of Jacob, one house, okay? The house of Jacob is the, is the returning point. Um, I would also say that if you, um, if you go look at Ezekiel chapter 37, where it talks about the two sticks coming together, if you go to, to um, the latter part around verse 19, it talks about no more will they be two nations, and, and maybe that's coming up here in a second. Um, no more will they be two nations, but they will be, uh, they will be one or, or united. Echad doesn't mean they become one. It means they become united, right? We can talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Now, I've got a really detailed picture here, and you can't read it right there. So we're going to take this in pieces, and I'm going to blow it up so you can see it. But the whole story is in one picture. What I want you to see here from the grand, grand zoomed out picture, and this actually has the ends cut off in order to make it fit. What you can see is that there's a single line coming in the middle that separates. There's a top line and a bottom line, and then they come back together. And at the end, those lines travel together just like Jacob, just like Jacob. Let's look at it, okay? So if we look at the first first half of this, you see here in this imagery, let me see if I can 
get a, uh, I don't know if this will let me do a um, highlighter. Yes, it will. Right up here, we have a timeline. Across the top, you see this timeline right here. Okay, this timeline is going to be approximate years. It's not necessarily to scale, but it gives us an idea as we count down with some major dates in here. Right here in the blue boxes, as you go across in these blue boxes, we've got um, the books of the Bible and how they fit into this timeline, the events. You see Ruth and Judges down in the middle of the screen. Um, and then the, the center line is the line of mankind as it comes down to Jacob and then ultimately to Israel. That's this, that's this center line you see right here. Okay. At the bottom, what we've got is we've got Judah and uh, Rehoboam, or I, I'm sorry, we've got Judah and Joseph. We've got the 12 sons by the four wives. You see on the outside of the box are the four wives, Leah and Zilpah on the left, uh, Rachel and Bilhah on the right. We see the lists of the sons that were born to each of those two groups. And what we see is we see that the four wives, um, we see that the four wives are, uh, the sons are listed in birth order. We see Rachel and Bilhah as um, one side or one, one family, and we see Leah and Zilpah as the other. We see the boys listed um, in, according to the, their mothers, as well as a number next to them explaining or demonstrating their um, order of birth, birth order, and then the, the bold here with Judah and Joseph demonstrates the family leaders, okay, in their respective parts of the family. This little arrow right here between Judah and Benjamin is significant because what this does is this, this demonstrates the connection between Benjamin and Judah that we will see all the way through history from the time that Judah makes a covenant to protect Benjamin when he takes him with him to Egypt to face Joseph. And then Benjamin becomes the bargaining chip between Joseph and Judah. And ultimately we see Benjamin's, uh, uh, that connection between them strengthens with, um, with David and Jonathan and the connection between David and Jonathan as Benjamin and Joseph. And then we see that strengthened even more uh, with the fact that the temple is built in, in Jerusalem. However, a portion of it actually resides on Benjamite territory, as I understand it, based on where the line is. And Benjamin is the bridge, or it's the land between Judah and Ephraim. So Benjamin is always sort of in this, in this interesting position between the two, which may explain significantly why um, Paul, a Benjamite, tribe of Benjamin, winds up being the messenger from Judah to the scattered nations Ephraim. But let's not get bogged down in that. What I want us to do, though, is understand that we've got um, that, that we've got the families here, and then as we go into the kingdom at Mount Sinai, God, God already sees them as two separate brides. We already saw that. We saw that in Ezekiel chapter um, 23. And then we only have just 120 years of a united kingdom where all 12 tribes are under the headship of one king. First Saul for 40 years, and then David, and there was a short period in there, about seven years, when they were not all under David's headship, but then David is king, and then Solomon is king, and they're all under headship. And then early in Rehoboam's time frame, the kingdoms are divided. And this right here is where we see the family split. Jeroboam and the northern kingdom, we see here in this upper line, Rehoboam and the southern kingdom, we see here in this lower line, and the two houses, or the two brides, Leah, or Judah, and Rachel, Ephraim. So this is the picture that we've got going forward. Let's move to the next page. Here we are on the next page as we continue to slide over. We just looked at, we saw it to this point right here. This right here is where the, where the kingdom is divided. 
okay? The kingdom is divided right here under Rehoboam, and you've got the northern kingdom from this point forward, and you've got the southern kingdom. And you see the prophets, the blue, the, the middle blue box right in the middle, 1 Kings 12 through uh, Malachi, the Italian prophet, right? Uh, Malachi, Malachi, okay? Um, in the northern kingdom with Ephraim, the house of Israel is composed of Reuben and Dan and Naphtali and Zebulun and Issachar, Gad, Manasseh, Asher, and parts of Levi. Southern kingdom is ben Benjamin, parts of Levi, Shimon, and of course, Yehuda. And then the destinies of the two houses are very different. As we move to the right, we, see, we recognize that the northern kingdom um, moved into idolatry. And then they were divorced. We see that in Jeremiah chapter 3. They're scattered. The lost sheep of the house of Israel is how they're often referred to. And, uh, and there are laments in Scripture among the prophets that where have they gone? And will they ever come back? And, of course, Josephus at, his, at the time after Yeshua, he says they knew where parts of the tribes were at this point. And we actually can recognize that parts of them wound up as Parthians and Scythians and, and other things. All of these, it's all scripturally supported, and there are those who have done great and detailed studies in figuring out where the tribes went. But the bottom line is they were scattered to the ends of the earth, and they wound up uh, um, blended into every tribe, tongue, and nation on the planet. And ultimately, that is from whence Yeshua will gather from every tribe, tongue, and nation who will worship before the throne. Okay? The southern kingdom also was involved in, uh, in idolatry, and there was some exile, but they were restored and returned to the land. That was the time that they spent in Babylon. And then we have the coming of the Messiah. Okay? Um, and with the coming of the Messiah, then we see the Gospels, Matthew through Jude, and uh, the book of Revelation, okay, or all, all that is written as part of that. I guess I don't have the book of Revelation in there, but yes, that is, that is part of it. We see the Messiah come down. We see um, that ultimately Peter goes to the Jews. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. The northern kingdom, however, was scattered uh, they lost their identity. He never lost who they were. He never ceased to be a little shelter in the wilderness for them, right? And he hid them, if you will, in church pews uh, as one place that they were hidden. The southern kingdom, Jerusalem was sacked. The Jews were dispersed. And the end result is this great... Uh, jealousy, this great battle that's been going on for about 2,000 years between the two brides, between the two brides, the house of Israel, the house of Judah, and envy and jealousy. And we see this particularly discussed in uh, Isaiah chapter 11, where it talks about the raising up of a banner, and he's going to gather his people, and no more will Judah be uh, jealous of Ephraim and Ephraim of Yehuda, so on and so forth, right? That's the two brides. And then what we have here at the end, as I understand it from, from or not at the end, it's actually, actually at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. It's at the end of the current age that we're in. But there will be a time of Jacob's troubles and well, we would probably understand a second exodus or something of that sort, a gathering of the people. I no details on how that gets pulled together, but the goal is for the house of Jacob to come together and dwell in the land for the millennial kingdom under the headship of uh, Ye uh, Messiah Yeshua ben David, right? And we see this pictured multiple places in Scripture. We can see the... Uh, the, the word kahal or assembly in, um, in the Tanakh or in, the, in what some would call the Old Testament is the same. It, it maps to the Greek ekklesia, assembly. If you go to Acts chapter 7, verse 38, I think, it talks about Yeshua as being the angel who spoke with them at Mount Sinai, spoke to the assembly. 
And the word there is ecclesia, or the church in the wilderness, but your Bible probably doesn't translate it that way because, ooh, they don't want you to actually think that you're part of Israel. Different story. But this, this whole paradigm shifting um, lesson should help us out here. So really what we've got for the last 2,000 years is two brides at war. Scripture. And some of y'all will have a total conniption when I say this. But Scripture is a polygynous love story. It's about, it's the love story of Elohim who has two brides. One is in the house blocking the door saying, that woman will never come back in here. And largely obedient to the rules of the house but don't recognize who the husband is. And the other bride got kicked out of the house for disobedience for adultery, justifiable, should have stayed out. And yet the husband was willing to be a sacrifice for her so that, Romans chapter 7 verses 1 through 5 or 6, so that the covenant could be, could, could be, they could be released from the covenant and instead be raised in newness of life and be rejoined to him, the same one who covenanted with them in the first place from Mount Sinai. It was Yeshua who stood on Mount Sinai and spoke to Mo Moshe mouth to mouth. Go study that out. That's a good one. Got, a, got, got some of that on my blog. But here's the, here's the bottom line. The, the bride that's out of the house, Ephraim, just wants to come home. I just want to love my master, right? The problem is, is most of the bride out of the house is not following the house rules. The Messiah says, these are my rules. The house rules are the Torah, Shabbat, feasts, eating clean, uh, so on and so forth, right? All of that. They recognize the husband, but they're not willing to completely submit themselves to his rules. So let's talk for a second about this envy and jealousy between the two brides. And he will lift up a standard for the nations and assemble the banished ones of Israel and will gather the dispersed of Yehuda from the four corners of the earth. Then the jealousy of Ephraim will depart and those who harass Yehuda will be cut off. Ephraim will not be jealous of Yehuda and Yehuda will not harass Ephraim. The two of them, instead of doing this, will learn to walk together in peace. There will be peace in the house. This is what the, the head of the house desires is that the two walk together in peace, in obedience and harmony. Not that one becomes the other or that one supplants the other or one takes the place of the other. No. Come house of Jacob. Let us walk in the light. Thus says Adonai Yahweh, Behold, I will take the stick of Yosef, which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel, his companions, and I will put them with it, with the stick of Yehuda and I will make them one stick. The word is echad, and that means united. It doesn't mean yachid, one. It's echad, right? And they will be one, united, in my hand. Say to them, thus says Adonai Yahweh, Behold, I will take the sons of Israel, B'nai Israel, from among the nations where they have gone, and I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. And I will make them one nation, in the land, or one house in the land, on the mountains of Israel, and one king will be king for all of them, and they will no longer be two nations, and no longer be divided into two kingdoms. Okay, I think this is the picture where where um, Jacob brings his family back together. Okay, and ultimately, if you look at that picture, what happens is Rachel dies after they bury their um, idols under the terebinth tree and go and sacrifice, Rachel then dies in childbirth with Benjamin. The picture isn't that one becomes the other. The picture is that they walk together in unity, and it's from that point forward, Leah is the one in the house with Jacob. Isaiah chapter um, 2 says, The word of Yahweh, or the, uh, the word was Yeshiyahu, the son of um, Amoz saw concerning Yehuda and Yerushalayim. Now it will come about that in the last days, this isn't a prophecy from way back, this is a prophecy for now and in the future. 
In the last days, the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, that we may walk in his paths and that the Torah or the law will go forth from Zion and the word of Yahweh from Yerushalayim. Now, who is the word of the Lord? That's another really neat study. If you go study the Memrad Yeyah in the authoritative Aramaic translations of the uh, Torah called the Targumim, the Memrad Yeyah over and over and over. And that's where John gets the idea when he talks about the word made flesh. He's talking about the word of the Lord. It's not a new concept. He's not introducing something new. That is something that is in the scriptures. It's in the, in the authoritative translations that predate Yeshua. Okay. It says, He will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they learn war. Come, house of Jacob. Let us walk in the light of Yahweh. So let's talk about a few of the FAQs, some of the frequently asked questions. But why have I been taught one bride? And that's a good question. I think the reason we've been taught one bride, part of it is because it was God's desire and design for us to be separate through history for a period of time. I don't, I don't lay blame directly, though there are those who can be blamed directly for this. But the one bride idea, the one bride theology that is present in both the houses is actually a theology that stems from jealousy and it stems from Greco-Roman law. Nowhere ever, nowhere ever in scripture does God teach one bride. It's not there. In fact, uh, if you go do a word search for bride in the New Testament, you will find that it's only used it, in the English. We're only given six times. Five of those are the Greek word nymphe, which is the normally translated as bride. Okay, and that that word never is related to. The, the, the bride of Messiah, okay? It's referred to Jerusalem. It talks about, you know, uh, the wedding at Cana, and it talks about, uh, there's some other places that it shows up. There is a use in chapter 19, verse 7 or 8, where it talks about the bride has made herself ready, but that's not the Greek word nymphe. It's actually gune. It says the woman, and gune can be of a divorced woman, which would be an appropriate understanding of the house of Israel that has been made dirty in the nations and has to make herself clean. She's washed her robes and been made clean. And she's the one that's out of covenant. Because ultimately, if you go back and look at the new covenant, it says, in those days, I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. It doesn't say I'll make a new covenant with the whole house. It says, I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel. So Israel comes back into covenant. Now, that's not to say that Judah doesn't need to recognize the Messiah. Zechariah chapter 12, I think especially, talks about how they will see the one whom they have pierced and they will mourn um, the house of David, the house of Aaron, the house of Nathan. And there's another interesting clue for where the true Messiah came from. He did not come through the line of Shlomo. If we have a son of David from the line of Shlomo, you better look out because he's not, he's not the real deal. Okay. Um, so another question that's often asked is, well, are Christians joined to Judah? No. One, that, that's two houses. We, don't, we can't become the other stick. You can't have two houses come together if, if one becomes the other one. That only leaves one house. It doesn't leave two. Okay, The two houses have to come together under Jacob and grabbing onto the Messiah and his Torah, but not, not by becoming Jews or Jews becoming Christians. Both 
should recognize Yeshua, and both need to recognize the Torah. Which takes us to uh, FAQ number three. How does the Torah awakening relate? And the Torah awakening largely has to do with the fact that um, we are being awakened to the fullness of what it means to walk in his ways. What is it that he commands? Was, was Jesus at Mount Sinai? Was Jesus in the garden? Was Jesus there every step of the way? Can he change God's law? Or is he simply fulfilling, shows us how to live it rightly, and then giving us the way to get back into the covenant through his own death, burial, and resurrection? The Torah awakening, as we have believers around the world wakening to Torah, they're stopping and saying, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Some of these things God says, they're my things. They're not Jewish things, they're my things. And this is how I expect my people to act and operate and worship me. So, need to take a good look at that. Um, uh, FAQs, somebody might say, well, this is revolutionary information, but does it really matter? The fact is, I believe that you cannot understand prophecy correctly. You cannot understand the trajectory of history correctly. You cannot understand scripture or even a lot of things the Messiah or Paul say correctly until you understand that they're two brides. And all of scripture points to this. And it's easily defendable. In fact, um, I, I believe that one of the most indefensible positions now that I've really done the study and, I, and have looked at this whole thing and looked at history and the whole nine years, one of the most indefensible positions is monogamy only. It's, it's entirely indefensible. There's, it's got more holes in it than a chicken wire canoe. I'm just, I'm, you know. The simple fact is, God has two. And he tells us that explicitly, and he shows us that implicitly through all of Scripture and through the stories, through prophecy, through the trajectory of where we're going. So there's a lot there. It's worth studying. Go study it. Don't just go... Eh, I don't know. No, this is worth looking into deeply. So a few resources. Now, I've got a blog, and uh, and I've got lots of writings on lots of different pieces. There are probably about 1,500 articles on there, or 1,500 posts. Some of them are full articles. Some of them are not. Okay? Um but specifically, there's a large section dealing with marriage and what Scripture says about marriage and headship and patriarchy and God's design for man, God's design for women, God's design for the assembly, God's design for Israel. Uh, got a whole book on that, Authority, Headship, and Family Structure, that goes through the Torah portions and then pulls all the other scriptures from all over the place to put it all together in one, one big, thick 400-page book. Cheap, too. I think it's 16 bucks on Amazon or something. You need one. Uh, there's also 113 Restoration, which deals specifically with, uh, with the headship and, and patriarchy side of it. That comes from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, where it says the order is God, Messiah, man, woman. Um, there's also biblicalfamilies.org. Now, that is an online community of people who understand what Scripture says about marriage. Um, Christian and Torah backgrounds, um, not a full agreement on a lot of things there. So there's, there's some debate and, and discussion there, but uh, that's, a, that's an online community with a, um, with a forum where you can come ask questions, particularly as regarding marriage. Uh, and it's fascinating because there are a lot of people in Christendom who have come to a place where they understand headship and patriarchy and they understand biblical marriage what God says with regards to marriage and what he doesn't say, um, they've come to understand this and accept it and embrace it in cases God has called them into plural families. And I know families that have been plural families for 25 or more years. Very successful. Not an easy thing, uh, particularly when you've got to deal with all the garbage from a culture that's entirely uninformed and totally Greco-Romanized, Westernized, opposed to uh, what scripture actually and truly says. But it's a good place to go and get questions at answered, good place to have discussion. You can just read. You can read anonymously, anonymously on the forum. 
There is uh, also another book. I talked about 10 Parts in the King, lots of good resources there. Strongly recommend that. I don't know, it's maybe, what, 200 pages, 100, 180 pages. I've got a copy right here. Um, yeah, 185 pages, plus or minus. Uh, a, a fairly fast read that that will assemble many of these pieces, but interestingly, without me bringing in marriage until I realized, I realized actually it was late in the stages of writing that book and it was a bridge too far at that point, but I've written enough other things on it this matter. So I recommend, I, I really, I strongly recommend that you um, dig into the scriptures uh, reach out to me through my blog, or you could come to my YouTube channel at uh, Peter Peter Rambo. I think it's Peter Rambo. Uh, it could be Peter G. Uh, you can find me at Peter G. Rambo on YouTube. And uh, and let's see what what the scriptures say. Come, let us reason together, says Yahweh. Though your sins be as scarlet, they will be whiter than snow. Get the truth. Well,